The Center for Communicating Science is pleased to present Teaching Improvisation to Scientists with Alan Alda. Located at Stony Brook University, the Center collaborates with Brookhaven National Laboratory and Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. The end result will be to get you a little bit out of your head and into your whole body and into and open up a channel so the real you comes out. I uh, hope that doesn't scare you too much. <laughs> we brought some scientists together for an experiment. We want to see if they can improve on the way they communicate science by playing improvisational theater games. The games are pretty rigorous and they take a while to learn. They also take a willingness to let yourself go in front of other people. This is really hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, kidding. kidding. <laughs> it makes the whole, the whole science, science thing, thing look really, really easy. easy. <laughs> in these brief workshops, the scientists first learn to be more aware of their own bodies and more observant of what others are doing. They mirror one another's movements. They create things out of imaginary space. And with a make-believe rope, they get into a real tug of war, all to prepare them for the games to come later. As antic as some of this is, our goal is not to dumb down the science. On the contrary, we're hoping these participants will find greater clarity in presenting science, clarity and a vividness that will make their presentation stick in a listener's head. All right, so I know you like CSI. So you know how they identify people? They're looking at their fingerprints, their DNA. Everyone has their own unique fingerprint and set of DNA. Well, I look at that for inorganic compounds. Every inorganic compound... In this compound game, while one player talks to another about his or her research, the players in the audience have to guess what the imaginary relationship is between the pair on stage, just by listening to the way they talk. Or, but I have the added bonus, where I can actually figure out exactly what the atomic structure is by breaking down that pattern, something they can't do on CSI. <laughs> well, that's really cool. I mean, that, that, that has nothing to do with French literature, which is what I study, but hey, you know, go for it, man. <laughs> who do they think they are? Good friends. Or... Good friends. So who did you think he was to you? I was just going with one of, one of my good buddies who knows nothing about what I do or really uh -huh. understands any yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's what you picked up? Well, I thought I hadn't seen him for a while, uh -huh. so he was catching me up. So I study these cone jellies, which are actually, they look like jellyfish, but they're really not. What I'm doing back at school is I actually um, bring water back and I bring the uh, comb jellies back and I run experiments with them and I see what they're feeding. What, oh, what happened to that thing? <laughs> <laughs> what? Whoa, <laughs> he just broke a whole jar of jellyfish. <laughs> What I've been working on lately is trying to understand diversity of leaf form, and I've been using Dioscorea as a model system because Dioscorea, they're, they're vining monocots, as you probably know. I, I combine that data on anatomy and physiology with data on the distribution of the species in Mexico. Okay. Did you get it, who you were? I, I was feeling like um, she was explaining, uh, almost like a job interview, yeah, and that's, I yeah. was... Uh -huh. Yes, exactly her. right. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's like, really interesting nervous, about she... this? <laughs> Look how it changes the way you do it, right? It adds an extra element. This gave it some kind of intimacy, some kind of direct communication. The object, of course, is not to turn these scientists into actors but to help them become more open and direct in their communication of science. This is, this is something that you care about, mm -hmm. and, and, and you care about it in a personal way, I take it, otherwise you wouldn't be working on it. So really let that come out, and even if you don't make all the points you want to make. Okay. See if you can, just take a second and see if you can, if you can come up with that. All right. um, if all you can think back to when you were a baby, um, your favorite baby toy, Chances are, um, it's plastic. Um, most make it more personal. <laughs> same idea, same idea. How could you make that more personal? Um, if you had a baby and you... Why, why us? Why not you? Okay, I have a baby at home. <laughs> 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 and he has tons and tons of toys and all of them are plastic. And in this plastic, a lot of times, is a compound called phthalate diesters. And these are, these are plasticizers that make this toy into the little... Um, boulders or whatever it is that my son wants it to be. And when he sticks that, um, that bulldozer or that squishy toy into his mouth, these phthalates can move out of that squishy toy and into his mouth. Um, in the same way, these, these phthalates are used to make all kinds of products that we use every day. 
Um, and in the same way, they move out of that product and into us, into our toilets, our showers. Um, and they move um, through the sewage system and into the marine environment, and that's where I come in. So, after a few hours of these games, was there, in fact, a noticeable difference in these scientists' presentations? Take a look at these clips that were shot before a workshop and then after. We shoot neutral atoms at a sample. The neutral atoms deposit their internal energy onto the sample, changing the sample and then allowing it again to be developed, much in the same way as photography. You expose film and then develop it. Neutral atoms have to be, well, they can't be controlled by electric fields because they're neutral, so they actually get controlled by light. No, Pretty I, much, no, they don't, they, they're, they don't interact with a lot of things because they don't have a charge, and the biggest thing we have floating around is electric fields. It's electric fields are, again, this particle, field, wave-particle duality. The, the wave part is typically an electric field, and so it's what we use to... Uh, run our radios, it's what, the, what current runs through the wall, and so these neutral atoms don't interact with the current in the wall. So it's really nice, you can have a very, very tight control over what they do because they don't interact with everything else that's going on. The one thing that they do interact with is a specific kind of light that's tuned exactly to the atom. And what's really elegant about this uh, neutral atom lithography is that instead of, so with photography and with photolithography, you're shooting light through matter to make a pattern, and here we're shooting matter through light and ultimately making a pattern. Anything that's in the soil, as it's filtering through, can get mobilized into the groundwater, things like fertilizers or pesticides or leaky sewage pipes. Um, all of that gets into the groundwater and moves along down through the uh, aquifer. The beaches I like to go to personally, I don't like to swim in anything that I can't see the bottom of. And part of that is, you know, part of what makes it difficult to see the bottom of the seafloor is the, all of the things that are growing in the water. The first few true leaves evolved about 350 million years ago. A great variety of leaf forms have arisen. And these include many specialized forms like protective spines of cacti, or the colorful leaves of poinsettias that most of us actually think of as flower petals, but are really leaves. Uh, but I'm enamored with a very particular part of life, which is plants. I just, I just want to know about them. I want to know what biodiversity is, what are the patterns of diversity, and why is it there? You know, uh, you might think, well, leaves, they all pretty much do the same thing. They're very specialized leaves like cacti, cacti spines. But most leaves are there, they capture light, and they take up CO2. But Despite all basically doing the same thing, there's so much variety of leaf form. I mean, you have pine needles, you have palm fronds, blades of grass, maple leaves, oak leaves, that's just to name a few. I mean, it could go on. And so what I'm trying to understand is what's generated all this diversity? Why are there so many different kinds of leaves? And this is a really big question. Great, okay. thank you. It's much easier when you make it up than when you actually <laughs> write it the night before. <laughs> Well, let's see. What do you, you mean? You mean when you don't follow the script? Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, you're still saying real stuff. Right. But you're letting it come out of you as it comes out at the moment. Right. There was so much wonderful animation in your faces and your bodies, and you were whispering, whispering and chuckling, and it was really great. I feel like I know you all now so well <laughs> because you've really let yourselves be present here. So thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it. I hope I see you again. I'll see you. if I don't see you in. Uh, an issue of science or nature. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you on Broadway. On Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. For more information about the Center for Communicating Science, please email Center for Communicating Science at stonybrook.edu.